next guest is uh, well known to most of you, the man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him a small one in the um, lengthy profile of him that was done by Adam Gopnik in New Yorker magazine. He said that watching Jamie do sleight of hand was akin to watching Yo-Yo Ma work the scales on a cello. Please welcome my friend, Jamie Ian Swiss. <clears throat> Thank you. So some time ago, a uh, well-known magician, prominent magician, contributed an article to a national magazine entitled The Future of Magic. And in it, he addressed a question that magicians often hear uh, in various forms. Will the wonders of science, with, with, faced with the wonders of science and, and advances and so on, will, how will magicians continue to make a living? In other words, will advances, advances in technology and science uh, eventually render magicians uh, obsolete? And the magician said that, well, wonders of science, fabulous, true, but uh, they could never really threaten magic, could never really make a problem for magic because the appeal of magic is timeless. The experience of magic has a realistic sense to it, and it's that immediacy, that uh, liveness, that distinguishes magic from experiences defined by technology, things like movies or television or even holograms that I'm sometimes asked about. But the magician did not address or mention uh, television or movies or holograms. The wondrous new technology he was talking about was the telegraph. Uh, the man's name was David Devant. He was one of Britain's greatest magicians. The magazine was The Strand, and the year was 1919. Now, What's the difference between technology and magic? Well, there's no simple definition of magic. If I just say something literal like uh, the, de the convincing depiction of the impossible, uh, that doesn't really cut it. You could say the same thing about special effects in movies. Uh, one uh, good attempt, brief attempt, it also, that also doesn't speak to the art and magic at all. So one good brief attempt, at least, by a friend and colleague, Max Maven, is that magic is the aesthetic exploration of mystery. And he also points out that many arts utilize mystery in their subject and in their expression, but only magic specializes in it. Only magic is about mystery at its core. This is an iPhone. And uh, in it, I have a deck of cards. <laughs> okay, it's a full deck. And I can shuffle it. Uh, although, with magic tricks, it's better if you shuffle face down. <laughs> and are they seeing this? Yeah? Okay. And, uh, okay, and now, um, hi. Uh, could you do me a favor and think of a card for me? Okay. And uh, we'll just uh, kind of uh, get right to it. Uh, name your card out loud for me, if you would. You, you want to use the same, you want to use the same card. The three of hearts. Really? Okay, so I'm going to go, can we see? I'm going to go through these cards like this because previously, before asking you that, and we didn't prearrange anything before, the, before this, right? You, you're not the right guy? <laughs> but previously, I put a card face down in this deck. Ah, there's the face down one. And if I just turn that over, it's your... Three of hearts. <laughs> Pretty neat, huh? But it's not magic. It's not magic. Well, Arthur C. Clarke's famous f uh, third law, right, said that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. But I believe that the trick with the iPhone is actually quite thoroughly distinguishable from magic because, as Michael Weber uh, tweeted, Any magic excessively dependent on technology will never be perceived as magic, or, or, or sorry, will be indistinguishable from technology, or any insufficiently disguised technology will never be perceived as magic. So I want to talk about this difference between technology and magic in terms of what magic isn't, yes? Um, because what you get from the iPhone, the iPhone trick is a puzzle. It's puzzling. 
but it's a puzzle waiting to be solved. It doesn't leave you with the sense that the laws of physics have been repealed suddenly or temporarily, right? It doesn't leave you with a lingering sense of mystery that I think maybe we had with when Michael had two people up here connected somehow, or even Eric just now, who also used a phone, but in a very different way for a similar, something I think was really mysterious. Because magic at its best is not just a puzzle. A puzzle is something waiting to be solved. This iPhone trick is puzzling, but it leaves a lot of clues, I think, as to how it might have operated. It doesn't rattle your sense of how the world works for that temporary moment. Um, and, uh, and you know, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to try and use your mind to try and think about how magic works. But the fact is that magicians work very hard to minimize, to engage you and minimize the sense of puzzle or challenge so that we can engage you in the experience of mystery. Yes, some of us are going to use our minds to think about how magic works. Okay, fair enough. We're humans. We're curious about how the world works. But if you spend all your time in the movie theater trying to work out the special effects, you're never going to give yourself over to the narrative experience. You're never going to engage in story and character. And that's an emotional connection. Magic should be an emotional and aesthetic experience. A puzzle is an intellectual one, an intellectual problem that needs to be solved. Magic is an experience. And the experience of magic is deeply connected to conditions. It's that liveness. It's the immediacy. It's that sense of reality that sets magic apart from technology and other kinds of artistic and performance experiences. Uh, people are intuitively aware of this. One of the things we hear very often, if I perform close-up magic, I always hear people say, I always thought if I was this close, I'd see how it worked. And that means you intuitively grasp that even the distance from the seat to the stage can be used to the magician's advantage. And it is. And so if conditions are a factor, if conditions are suspect even at that small distance, conditions really become a factor if you're trying to do magic on television. Some years ago, I collaborated with uh, Edward Tufte in a chapter called Explaining Magic, a book, Visual Explanations. And there we wrote that, um, that video representations or video recordings of magic are deeply suspect. Did the assistant uh, vanish from the box because the camera was turned off or because of a real trick? After all, what we consider the effects of magic are fundamentally trivial, right? Look, I can change a red ball to a green ball. Worship me. And you can see all the basic effects of magic in your average television commercial. But, and it's a big but, you can't reach into the commercial and touch the props. You can't interact with the performance. You can't ask a question, give an answer, think of something that would change the outcome of the events. And it's that authenticity, that unpredictability, that's part of what defines the magical experience. So if magic on TV is always suspect, if it's always, a, I would say, a compromised version at best of the magical experience, well, what about movie magic? Now, the special effects of, uh, in, of uh, what is it, uh, Inception uh, might have been compelling, but for every example like that, we see countless examples where special effects don't work as intended. Um, one small example, if you remember the movie uh, Spielberg's uh, Minority Report, well-received, popular, but I always think of a moment in there. It's the beginning of a chase scene. Tom Cruise is jumping from flying car to flying car, kind of up the side of a building. And to me, this was an example of overreaching with special effects. Because for me, I just can't get it out of my head that nothing on the screen is real except the actor. And he's jumping from place to place in a soundstage somewhere in front of a green screen. So this is an example of special effects working in the opposite, failing because they take you out of the story instead of engaging you in. Right? So this is kind of like if I make a mistake. If I make a mistake in a sleight of hand maneuver, I give you a little glimpse, what magicians call a flash. I've done you a terrible disservice because now I'm going to take you out of the effect that I'm trying to create. Magicians are trying to conceal, trying to make you forget that there's any technology at all, a mirror, a trap door, a sleight of hand maneuver, so that you can stay engaged in the magical experience. And I, don't, I shouldn't distract you from that. Now, the uh, director, Christopher Nolan, <clears throat> who did Memento, Batman Begins, Dark Knight, uses a lot of special effects. Oh, and our colleague Michael Weber actually worked on this. Uh, no, I'll come back to that, actually, in another film that Nolan made. But about using special effects, Nolan says, anything you notice as technology reminds you that you're in a movie theater. Even if you're trying to portray something fantastical and otherworldly, it's always about trying to achieve invisible manipulation. This is exactly 
what I meant. This is what magicians are trying to do, make you not think about it. Now, interestingly, Nolan made a movie about magic, which Michael Weber worked on as a consultant, called The Prestige. He had to depict magic on film. He said, basically, the idea was always really not trying to show magic in the film and impress people with stage magic, because that can't work on film. People are aware of special effects. So be it film or television, the problem is always that issue of credibility. It might seem magical, but it's not the same as magic. Now, live theater, even though it's live, is still different from magic. I'll give you a simple example. Let's say we go to see Peter Pan, right? And when Peter Pan flies, we see the wires. And yet it doesn't trouble us. It doesn't even trouble us that he's probably a she. Why is that? Because we willingly contribute our suspension of disbelief in Coleridge's famous phrase. And we don't let it trouble us. We give it up for the story, and we paint out the wires in our own sort of mental Photoshop. Now, some magicians think that the suspension of disbelief is also at play in magic, but I would disagree, as would some others, including uh, Teller of Penn and Teller, who says that far from magic depending on the willing suspension of disbelief, that actually magic is kind of, in his terminology, a theatrical rape of sorts, because we have to force the spectator to believe what they're seeing. And in order to do that, we have to add extraordinary evidence. We have to pass a hoop over the woman who floats to prove it. Right? But in the magic show, unlike in Peter Pan, if you should happen to get one little tiny glimpse of a wire, ah, magic show is a failure. That magician sucked. You tolerate no mistakes in your magicians. Trust me, I know. <laughs> but it's OK, you shouldn't. <laughs> Now, at EG2, I gave a talk about the methods of magic, whereas today I'm mostly talking about the effect. So the effect side, different from method. But one little part of the method I want to address is this, and some of this I'm quoting extensively from the work of Whit Hayden, a friend and colleague, of, a magician from Los Angeles, who says that all magic is based on creating a logical argument in the spectator's mind. The argument, what uh, logicians call a syllogism, is false. If we can get the audience to agree to every step in the argument, then eventually they will agree with the false conclusion. And we create a sort of illogical box or prison from which escape is difficult. Now, I'll give you a simple example. So let's say that the idea is that I'm going to make a coin vanish, a series of logical arguments. Step one, I place the coin in my hand, false. Step two, I close my hand around the corner. Uh, I close my left hand. True. You never took your eyes off the hand. True. I didn't do anything where I could have snuck the coin out of my hand. True. I snapped the fingers of the right hand. True. When I snapped my fingers, I opened the, fing the left hand. The coin had dematerialized. True. Therefore, when I snapped my fingers, the coin dematerialized. False. If I get you to agree to all the steps, including the first fall one, First false one, eventually you also have to agree with the false conclusion, even though you know that it's not possible. And the result of this is a feeling of cognitive dissonance. I know there's no such thing as magic. There is no other explanation. And if I can create this, if I can get you to agree with every step, including the false end, this um, creates an odd sort of sensation, right? It's a troubling sensation. And it's the job of the magician to trap the audience in this illogical box. The result is a peculiar state of mental, mental excitation. Again, quoting Whit Hayden, a burr under the saddle of the mind. Of course, there's more than one way to do it. <laughs> now, the reason I mention this side of method is to mention something else that then, uh, again, I'll quote from Whit Hayden here which is a problem, an unusual problem, that all magicians have to deal with in all of our work. And he states it this way. The experience of magic is not necessarily a pleasant one. The magician is hoisting the spectator onto the horns of a dilemma. There is no such thing as magic. There is no other available explanation. This can be a very creative and exciting place for people to be, but it is not a comfortable place for most people. And it's part of the job of the magician to make people more comfortable in this place. And so the magician uses story and narrative, personality, <clears throat> to charm the audience and to win them over to being comfortable in this place, living with that fallacy that they've been forced to accept even though they know it doesn't exist. And as Witt says, 
this way that we conceal the direct challenge to the ego. The sword of magic is concealed by the cloak of theater. So I've tried here to give you, lay a little foundation of things that aren't magic in order we to try and get to a, some sort of more clearer concept about what is magic. And uh, one of our greatest contemporary magicians, a man from Spain named Juan Tamariz, has said that magic transmits in an unconscious way the realization of the impossible desires of humanity. Now, I don't think that Tamariz means that everybody wants to be able to find a selected card. I think what he means is, is that there is in all of us a dream of being able to wave a wand and have power over the world, to make the world succumb to our wishes. And in this way, magic speaks to an unspoken but universal desire. I believe that aesthetically and symbolically, magic ultimately is about the very nature of mystery. Magic reminds us that things are not always as they seem, that life is full of the unexpected, the unpredictable, and even the unexplainable. Magic says, metaphorically, on a symbolic level, that that which has been destroyed perhaps can be restored. That which has disappeared can perhaps be made to reappear. And so magic says that with imagination and creativity, we can face the challenges of our lives. We can even overcome the tragedies of our lives. And this is where magic lives and breathes. By invoking the experience of magic, the experience of mystery, we confront the audience with their greatest wishes and their greatest fears. When someone says to me, how'd you do that? No, I don't want to know. They've basically addressed both at exactly the same time. It confronts that kind of knowledge, different kinds of knowledge. Do you want that information? Are you afraid of that information? Or is it a kind of knowledge you don't need to have or don't need to have today? And finally, although I've avoided the word, magic also has something to do with wonder. Now, I don't mean childlike wonder that we hear so much about. I think wonder is an adult, mature experience and emotion. <clears throat> childlike wonder says to me that wonder is something about not knowing. I think wonder is about knowing. When a scientist talks about that which they don't yet know or don't know at all, they don't mean something they can never know or will never be permitted to know or allowed to know. They mean something that they have the confidence that is ultimately knowable. And far from diminishing our appreciation of the universe, when we gain that knowledge, it will actually enhance our vision, enhance our beauty, our appreciation of the beauty and mystery of the universe around us. But when you have a firm grasp about how the universe works, you also get a clear idea of what you don't yet understand. And I think that when you stand on that threshold, of knowledge and mystery, that's where you experience real wonder, and that's where magic lives. So <clears throat> I've tried to say a little bit about what magic isn't, what magic is, and, uh, but I think I've had enough of telling you, so it's time for a little more show. Now when people ask me, uh, or find out I'm a magician, one of the first questions they ask you is, how'd you get started in magic? And uh, I often say, well, same way you did. Yeah, I know. But the thing about it is, especially if you're an American male, sometimes between the ages of 7 and 10, you got a, somebody gave you a magic kit. You can read a book on Houdini. Check that out. Check that out. Check that out. Yeah, there's some, actually, there's some balls in here. Check those out. Check that out. OK, and uh, you read a magic book on Houdini. Somebody gives you a magic kit. And uh, you get obsessed with, you dabble with magic. You get obsessed with magic for a few years or whatever. So we all get started the same way. There's no mystery in that. Then. Most of you turn 14 or 15 or 16, discover girls, decide to go out and have a life. I stayed home and practiced. <laughs> That's the mystery. I haven't got the answer. Now, when I got the magic kit, it came with a booklet like this, 102 Easy Magic Tricks. I haven't changed this since 1944. And uh, I love this. It actually says this. It is the natural desire for all of us to make ourselves agreeable when in company. If you will care, those were the day, days, huh? If you will carefully study the illustrations and instructions in this booklet, it is possible for you to become a skilled magician and the life of the party. If I'm lying, I'm dying. The life <laughs> of the party. Okay. All these look, all these look okay to you, right? Just some coffee cups I snatch from the place. Three little balls. They don't squeeze down or anything. They're not magnetic. Don't, don't, don't stick together. Anything like that. Okay. The life of the party. Yeah, sure. That worked. It didn't work at all. Uh, it didn't work for a number of reasons. One of the things the Magic Kit came with 
was uh, three little plastic cups for this trick. And uh, there's things it didn't tell you. It didn't tell you the trick is the cups and balls. It's not my title. Um, and it didn't tell you that this is like the oldest trick in magic, and this is the hardest trick in magic. So the kit, the magic kit, you get you're seven years old, you get the magic kit, it crushes your soul. It breaks your heart. Look, I have one, one, I have two, two, I have three balls. I'm not proud. <laughs> See, now I found the humor level of the room. But Andrea, if I was to ask you to choose which one of the three cups all three balls happen to return to, which one would you choose? There's only so many choices, darling. The center, such a good choice, but it's the one with the orange. <laughs> That's the secret to the trick. My cup's running over. <laughs> now, I've spent a few moments trying to explain to you a few things about what magic is and what magic isn't, because hopefully, perhaps now, you can understand a little better why in 1919, David Devant was so confident that the wonders of science and technology, even something as amazing as the telegraph, would never render magic obsolete. The Cups and Balls is, suppo is supposedly one of the oldest feats of magic that we know. Its workings are explained in literature over 400 years old. In 64 AD, Seneca reported seeing the cups and balls, and he said, it is the pure trickery of it that delights me or pleases me. But show me how it's done, and I lose interest in it. Right, that was 2,000 years ago. And like David Devant before me, I'm equally confident that 2,000 years from now, even if audiences travel to the magic show on a Jetsons flying car or a, by Star Trek transporter, they'll still be amazed and delighted in a memorable fashion, I hope by the skilled magician's performance of a timeless piece of magic, like the cups and balls. Thanks. Yeah, buddy. <laughs>